So open your Bibles to Acts chapter 14. We're going to continue our study, our journey through the book of Acts. We finally finished 13. I think it only took two weeks to finish chapter 13. That's good for me. And uh, we're going to look at, now I hope this doesn't scare some of you away, because we're going to look at sharing the same gospel in a different way. Now some of you will turn off right away. You go, oh, I don't want to share the gospel. Well, I just have to say one thing to you. Repent. Okay, just in Jesus' name, kindly, lovingly, repent. Because uh, it's like there's people dying all around. If, if you were in a lifeguard station and there's people drowning out there, would you go, I don't, I don't go out there in the water. I'll get wet. God has saved you and has forgiven you of your sins and have, has made you a child of God. How dare we not? care about the, the lost, okay? So we're going to touch on that today, but in a little different way. I, I would give you a little uh, spoiler alert. We're going to look at what I call creation evangelism, because we've been looking at how the gospel is preached to the Jews uh, as Paul went into synagogues, and we'll continue to look at that. But there's more than one way to share the gospel, as long as it points to Jesus. Uh, and depending on who you're talking to, you should take a different approach. So, Father, we ask that you guide us. Open our ears that we might hear. Open our eyes that we might see. As we look into your word now, I pray that you'd help us to learn what you want us to learn. And, Lord, I know that there's more than just how to preach the gospel in today's message. So give us ears to hear what you want to say to us personally in this text today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So a little review in case you uh, weren't here with us. that We've been following Paul and Barnabas on their very first missionary journey. They're well into it. Matter of fact, they'll be going home soon. And uh, they've been experiencing great success, great, but great opposition as well. I don't know if you know this, but when you serve the Lord, <clears throat> the way you, you uh, gauge success isn't a lack of opposition. Because <laughs> even like with this growth group thing, my wife and I have experienced big time spiritual warfare trying to launch this growth group thing. Big time spiritual warfare. And so if you're going to get involved as a leader or a host home, warning, I'm just telling you, when you step out to do something for the Lord, there's going to be opposition. So toughen up and just serve the Lord and enjoy. There's, you, you could recognize the success in spite of the opposition. And so in spite of that great opposition, in verse, chapter 13, look at verse 49. It says that um, the, the word of the Lord was beginning to spread throughout all the region, but the Jews stirred up devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city and raised up a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. But they shook the dust off their feet against them and came to Iconium. That's where they're going to be at now as we're looking at the, uh, the studies. As a matter of fact, you might want to put the map up because I like maps. If you like maps, put the map up on PowerPoint of Iconium and their journey. And verse 52 says, And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. We left off last week pointing out that even though they were kicked out of a city, so to speak, they went forward with joy and with the Holy Spirit. I think you could have tribulation and joy. It's modeled for us in the Bible. I think you could have troubles and joy. I think you could have, you know, nobody has a perfect life. You could have problems in your life, but still have joy, but not without the Holy Spirit. We need the Spirit of God in our lives. One of the things my wife and I pray constantly whether it's for ministry or whether it's for, what do you got? You didn't see, you didn't see this one, huh? <laughs> what a good brother. And that one's cold, yeah. Oh, it's them? Okay, blessings. Uh, anyway, we, you never, you can't live life without, without trouble, without challenge, without opposition. Uh, but our secret is the Holy Spirit. And what Linda and I pray constantly is, Lord, fill us with your spirit. It's not helping me to do a good job. Well, me, if it's just about me, we're in trouble. It's, Lord, fill me with you, because that's what we need. I hope you, you've learned that lesson, too. So as we look at verse 1 of chapter 14, we see Paul's strategy. It says, And it happened in Iconium, which they just fled to, that they went together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spoke a great multitude, both uh, that a great multitude, both of the Jews and the Gentiles, or the Greeks, believed. So there's great effect going on here. And uh, one of Paul's strategies, 
He was a Jew. He was a high-ranking Jew. He had the garb, you know, the special tassels and robe. When he went into a synagogue, they recognized, they saw his stripes. They recognized this guy is a high-ranking Jew, a Pharisee of the Sanhedrin. And they'd always say to the, a guest like that, well, thank you for visiting us. What do you have to share for us today? And Paul would stand up in the synagogue and preach the gospel. And now it's got to the point that the words got out and both the Jews and the Gentiles are coming. And so, as a matter of fact, but, but why did he go to the synagogue first? Well, I like what Romans 1.16 says. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Well, the gospel was promised to the Jews first. The Messiah was promised to the Jews and came uh, the, through the Jewish, the Hebrew line. And so the method was to go to the Jew first and then also to the Greek. Now, but notice here the manner. I just love this. I, I, don't think, I don't think preaching the gospel should be boring. You know, one of my prayers from time to time is, Lord, help me not to bore people with your word. Because the word of God is exciting. It's powerful. It's, it's life-changing. And if it's boring, it's my fault, not God's fault. Okay, I'm just warning you right now. If you go to sleep, it's either my fault or you just didn't get enough sleep last night. Okay, so be ready to pinch the person next to you. But notice it says, and they so spoke in verse 1. I like what, by the way, if you've got the notes, the inserts, this is for the growth groups. We're getting you to start doing the fill in the blank, help you stay, pay attention. This is Gusek's quote. I'm going to help you fill it in now. Because Gusek pointed out here, that Paul and Barnabas presented the gospel in a way that invited belief. The way they preached and encouraged people to believe in the message of who Jesus is and what he had done. It's about faith in Christ. You don't just give someone a feel-good message. It's not just, oh, I went to church today and I feel so good now. I'm glad I went. It's not about feel-good. It's all about make sure you're paying attention. It's always pointing people to Jesus to faith in him. I like the way the NIV puts it, that they, they spoke so effectively that a great number of both the Jews and the Gentiles believed. The New Living Translation says, they preach with such power. God help me that, that I never bore you with the word of God. That when I teach the Bible, it's, it gives, it's with the effectiveness and the power that it deserves because it is the quick and living word of God that changes the heart of those who believe. And so you should be reading the Bible, by the way, all week long. Don't just wait for Sunday, right? Amen? And so it, it's, a, it's a life changer. But some so-called evangelists make the good news about Jesus sound like bad news. I, was, I had heard about a certain preacher. I'm not going to mention his name. You might know him. Uh, and, and I hear he go, preaches around the, the Boise area. So I did a little YouTube search, found him, and he, he goes on the BSU campus. And he, and he goes out there with signs and and yells at people and says, why are you women dressed like that? And, and, and do you guys have premarital sex? And, and it's like, what the heck is he doing? It's like, that, that sounds like good news, you know? I mean, it's college kids. How many of you guys smoke marijuana, you know? And they're all going, yay! <laughs> and it, it, it's like, I don't think this is the right approach, you know? And, and so I want to present the gospel in such a way that people are excited and that they're drawn to Jesus rather than confused or twisted because I'm presenting it wrong. There's, there's people out there who make the good news sound bad because the goal of preaching the gospel is to get people to come to Christ in faith and repentance and confidence. Our, our witnessing should point to Christ in such a way that it encourages people to faith and surrender. And so I pray that every time you come to church, you get more reasons why you want to give your life to Jesus. You know, now sometimes we do need to be convicted of sin. I'm not shying away from that. Uh, but I just, I watched the method of Paul and Barnabas. I watched the early church, the apostles. I want to copy them. And so verse 2 tells us that the unbelieving Jews showed up. Wouldn't you know it? The unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Could I tell you that, uh, you know, I had a friend years ago, I still have friends, but this is a different one. Uh, and, and, and this friend used to have a saying. He'd always say, unbelief is a thief. And I think he's right. By the way, that's to fill in the blank. Unbelief is a thief because it'll rip you off. And as a matter of fact, if you watch what happens here in verse 2, um, some people aren't content just to not believe. They've got to get everybody else to not believe. They've got to jump on a, 
bandwagon, and they've got to poison the minds of those who might believe or who do believe. Now, now the Jews, these Jews were following them. They went over 100 miles following them, following Paul and Barnabas to, to poison the minds of the believers. And their motive was power because we've got this religion. It's Judaism. We don't want anybody, we don't want you to take people out of Judaism and bring them into that new religion. If they only knew that you can be a Jew and a Christian because Jesus was a Jew, and matter of fact, I call it being a completed Jew because if you're Jewish and you discover Jesus, you found your Messiah, and you're born again, and you're a born again Jew. You're a completed Jew. It's a good thing, okay? And so these Jews, though, it was a power struggle for them. And, and, and people love to press their influence on others out of jealousy, out of strife. Um, but let me just warn you, talk can poison minds. What you listen to can poison your minds. What you say could poison other people's minds. Excuse me for going off on a little bit subtopic here of verse 2, but it says the, the, these unbelieving Jews poison the minds of, the, of these believers. And I've seen it in church. I've seen it in ministries. All you need is a few complainers, a few rebel, rebel rousers. Is that what you call them? And, or, or they draw people to themselves and they go, yeah, well, I don't think they're doing it right over there. And then Pastor Mike, blah, blah, pss, 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 and his wife, pss, 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 and that ministry over there. Pss, pss, pss. And, and you could have been just fine. You could be happy as pie with the church. But now you heard this and you're going, yeah, yeah. Have you ever had that happen to you? Be careful. Guard your heart because talk can poison your mind. Criticism. One, another thing, Linda and I pray against all the time. We had to learn the hard way. We pray against the critical spirit. And so I know this is another topic, but I have to say it. Because it says in verse 2 that these unbelieving Jews poisoned the minds of the believers. Don't you think that another believer can't poison the mind of another believer? By just criticism and, and, and talking smack. There's no, there's no re reason for this. So be careful because words can poison minds. Verse 3 says, Therefore they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders done by their hands. Now, I, I don't always go this small, slow for those of you who are visiting. Well, usually do maybe. But I, I, I got to tell you something. Verse 3 says a whole lot because it takes energy it takes time and energy to undo poison minds, to bring antidote to poison minds, to safeguard the body of Christ against lies. It, it takes a while. If you've had your mind poisoned, you know it doesn't get cured right away. Sometimes you, you think you're in the, the right group. Yeah, yeah. And you're criticizing and bitter and critical. It takes a while to realize, man, the, I let the enemy in. I let the enemy get a hold of me. I had a bad attitude, and now I'm spreading poison to others. I have been poisoned, and now I'm toxic. I'm a toxic person to others. So be careful for that. And so the apostles knew we, need, we, we better stick around here. We better invest some time and energy into these Gentile believers. They're brand new, and they're having these unbelieving Jews come and poison their mind. And, and God even helped out with signs and wonders. You see that at the end of verse 3? God was confirming the word with signs and wonders. And so let me give you another subtopic here. Signs and wonders. I know there's some churches, it's all about signs and wonders. I believe we have a, a miracle producing God. I believe we have a God who does healings, who answers prayer, who does miracles. Amen and amen. Today he does too, okay? But let me tell you one of the reasons why in the early church we saw so much more, uh, at least we see so much more than, than we'll see average in our, well, for one thing, we're covering a 30-year period of time in the book of Acts, and we're just going from week to week in real life here. And so I think God's still doing signs and wonders. But I just got to point something out here. It says in, in verse 3 that the Lord, let me, let me show you the New Living Translation. The Lord proved their message was true by giving them power to do miracles and signs. I think that God, especially when this was a new message, People didn't know the word, the name Jesus, like we do today. And so they, God was confirming the word with signs and wonders. It kind of reminds me of the time in, in the Gospel of Mark when Jesus sent the disciples out to, two by two. And it says in Mark 16, 20, 
they went out and they preached everywhere and the Lord working with them confirming the word through accompanying signs I think one of the key reasons God does signs and wonders isn't just to give us a magic show but it's to get you to believe the word the word is true I'm gonna confirm it it's true it matter of fact I I take it even though you might not think it's a big miracle I take it, well, we got 100 people signed up for growth groups, is that the Lord is confirming His Word with signs and wonder. He's confirming His will with signs and wonder. I like it, and there's more. We might have 200 before, before this is over. So I'd ask our PowerPoint to put that next map up again. Let's continue reading. In verse 4, the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews, part with the apostles. Remember these unbelieving Jews poisoning the minds of the believers. Verse 5, when a, when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe and the cities of Laconia and to the surrounding regions. And, and so the, now we're another scattering here. And they were preaching the gospel there. So now even the believing Jews, remember that happened, the, the believing Jews in Jerusalem were scattered. Now we're seeing believing Gentiles being scattered and the apostles left as well. And can I just say this? We need wisdom when, when it comes to sharing the gospel. Wisdom of when to know when to stay and fight. And I don't mean fist fight. I mean stay and fight for the faith. And when to leave town. You know, like right now the thing that's going on with ISIS. These believers aren't going to stay and preach the gospel. They need to leave town, okay? So we need wisdom. Lord, are you telling me to stay and be, stand for the gospel, or are you telling me to leave town? And at this point, it was time to run, okay? And so I, I want you to, to remind you of, of what the gospel is. Look at verse 7. It says, And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet, sitting... A, 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 I'm, I'm, excuse me. I'm, I went to, I'm reading verse 8. Verse 7. They were preaching the gospel there. Re erase, Linda, for the tape, erase that. Verse 7, they were preaching the gospel there. One of the things I think it's important that God wants me to do is always make sure the people in my church know what the gospel is. I mean, there's church people. When you ask them, what's the gospel? They go, uh, go to church and be a good boy. You know, I want you to know what the gospel is. So what, what I want to do is, as a matter of fact, this is one of the fill in the blanks here. The, the, the gospel has, there's two truths I want to point out to you this morning concerning the gospel. One it contains facts about Jesus, okay? An and example, it contains facts about Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Paul says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He was rose again on the, on the third day according to the Scriptures. It's, but it's not just facts, okay? It's facts. you got to know the facts. Jesus died on the cross for my sins and yours. He rose again from the dead. You got to understand that. But somebody pointed out to me recently when I was arguing about the, the simplicity of the gospel, they says, that's not all. It's not just knowing those facts. And I thought, you know what, you're right. Because number two is faith in the gospel commands a proper response. If you just hear the facts, oh, it's nice. That's not enough. Faith in the gospel commands proper response. Let me give you two examples. We could go on with this. But Acts 3.19, one of my favorites. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. You hear the gospel? You know that Jesus died on the cross from your sins. Well, then that means you should repent of your sins, right? If Jesus died for my sins, I want to repent of my sins. So repentance is a part of that gospel call. But let me give you one more. It, it's another one of my favorite, Second Corinthians 5.15. And that he died for all, that they which live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So you hear the facts of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. He died for my sins. I need to repent of my sins. And then it says in 2 Corinthians 5.15 that he died for me that I might live for him. Do you know so many people miss that? They just think, well, I believe the gospel. Are you living for Jesus? Because if you're not living for Jesus, you're not obeying the gospel. You know, but, but you could do a word search on that one too and find out we are told to obey the gospel. And so the gospel the, of grace comes out to us freely. But it, it commands a response that we repent of our sins and that we live for Jesus. If you don't turn from your sins and, and, and live for Jesus, then 
you're no better than you were before you heard the gospel, right? Anyway, we could go on on that. I'll, I'll spare you, but I just want to make sure that I point that out. Verse 8 then says, <coughs> And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. And this man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up, straight on your feet. And he leapt and he walked. Well, there's a couple things in here. I don't know if the, the question marks come up or exclamation marks in your head. Um, one commentator, Boyce, said this, The apostles did not go into these cities to do miracles and then preach. Rather, it was the other way around. They went to preach, and sometimes there were healings. So here's a crippled man hearing the gospel, and grace came to him that day, and he was healed, as verse 9 says. But what puzzles me at first glance when I look at this is verse 9, the second part. It says that Paul, seeing that he had faith to be healed. Now that's interesting. Have you ever looked at somebody and says, I could see you have faith. Some, some commentators go, oh, they, he saw the look on his face. He saw the glow. He saw the smile. Let me just tell you what. It was a spiritual gift. You can't see faith in somebody. Okay? God gave Paul a word of knowledge, a word of discernment. He gave him insight. And so Paul looked at this guy, and he saw he had faith to be healed only because the Holy Spirit did a work there. There's some things. I can't teach you how to see faith in people. It's the Holy Spirit who did that, and, and he saw that he had faith to be healed. And, and so it, it can only be the word of knowledge or gift of the Spirit. You can look it up in 1 Corinthians 12, specifically verse 8 or more. It's, it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. But wait a second. Seeing that he had faith to be healed, does that mean it takes faith to be healed? Oh, boy, we could open up a can of worms with this one, right? Because I've seen poor people who are sick, and, and, and somebody go, you don't, if you only had the faith to be healed, you wouldn't be sick. And I want to kick those people who talk like that, okay? And, and people go every direction. Let me just tell you, there, there is an element that God wants you to believe his word and, and that you have faith to be healed, okay? That, that if God says, rise up and walk, that you don't go, tried it before, doesn't work. Yeah, certainly you've got to hear and obey the Word of God. Now, now, some people love their misery, by the way. I've met people who really don't want to be healed. They kind of like the excuse they have for not working and for not doing things. That, now, I'm not saying if you're sick, that's you. I'm just saying there's all kinds. Some people like their misery. Others are full of dar doubt and they can't believe. And, and unbelief is not the sole reason why God doesn't heal people. Let me go through a little list quickly, okay? Because I think we need to touch this from time to time. Because there's all this false doctrine out there telling you, if you only claim the verse, by his stripes you're healed. You'll, you don't have to be sick. I think that's a lie. I think that's a misappropriation of that verse, by his stripes. As a matter of fact, if you want, email me. I'll send you a whole Bible study on what that verse really means, by his stripes we're healed. It's not automatic healing for everybody who's sick. It's a so many people get hurt from a misunderstanding of Scripture and misapplication of Scripture. Sometimes it's the consequences of sin. I've known people who maybe they've got cirrhosis of the liver. And guess what they've been doing? Okay, I mean, sometimes they, some people have venereal disease. Guess what they've been doing? Okay, there are sometimes where it's the consequences of sin, but not always. Sometimes sickness is the only way God can get our attention. I've been, matter of fact, I told you, the reason I read that book about small groups and how we got started, I got neurovirus on a cruise. I'm quarantined in my room. I don't want to just watch the love boat over and over again on TV. <laughs> so I started reading. Sometimes the Lord's kind of corralling you. He's getting your attention. Sometimes he's doing a special work of grace in your life that if you didn't have to deal with this infirmity, you wouldn't be as close to him as you are. There's so many reasons why sickness comes. So why am I telling you this? I want to tell you, don't presume you know. When you see someone sick, don't go, uh-huh, you've been a bad boy. Stop it. Don't, don't feel condemned when you're sick, and definitely don't condemn others 
when they're sick because there's a big list of reasons and God's a big God and he's doing stuff you have no idea what he's doing. So let me t say that before we finish this story because this guy gonna get, he's getting healed, okay? Verse 11 says, when the, when the people saw what, it, what Paul had done, I mean, the guy just stood up. He'd never walked, stood up and started dancing. When the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And, and Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, or in the uh, Greek mythology, it, uh, or uh, Roman mythology, it would be Jupiter and Mercury. And because he was the f chief speaker, and there's a story behind that, I, I think, by the way, um, I think that Paul was a little guy. Remember we talked about that? And so he couldn't be Zeus. <laughs> Paul, they can't call him Zeus. Oh, look at little Zeus. Cute little Zeus. Can I hold him? <laughs> you know, Zeus is supposed to be the king of the gods, right? So they called Barnabas Zeus. He's probably a bigger guy. And, and Paul, they call, called Mercury or uh, Hermes because he was the, one of the chief speakers among their gods, supposedly. And then the priests of Zeus whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gate, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. Now, I bet you Paul and Barnabas at first didn't know what was going on because they didn't speak this language. And, and so they're seeing all this happen, and, and when, it, when it hit them, they had to do something about it. Um, now, something about the, the, the uh, polyistic Gentile beliefs. Uh, the people of Lystra had this legend. They had a legend that, that years ago, Zeus and Hermes came to visit their town. And Zeus and Hermes went from house to house, and everyone ignored them, and nobody showed hospitality. And, and one little old couple took them in and showed them hospitality. This is not a true story. Uh, and, and, and so Zeus and Hermes wiped out the whole town and took this little old couple and gave them the mansion on the hill and it became the temple of Zeus. That was their mythology. That was their legend. So guess what? Paul and Barnabas come into town, do a miracle. We don't want the town to be wiped out. Let's, let's sacrifice to them. This must be Zeus and Hermes. You see, there's a story. There's a backstory to this. That they, they're, they're superstitious and religious and so this is how they responded. So verse 14 says, but when apostles Barnabas and Paul, oh wait, apostles Barnabas and Paul. Do you notice Barnabas, Barnabas is being called an apostle here. There are the 12 apostles, but sometimes when somebody is being sent on a mission and God's anointing becomes plain on them, we recognize there's an apostolic gift and calling on their life. I have a dear friend, he's now pastoring Calvary Chapel of Pocatello, that for years, I'd say about 12 years, he planted churches in Russia. And whenever he'd come into town for a furlough, his name is Jeff Fatness, maybe some of you have met him, he'd come into town for a furlough. At that time, I was the mission pastor, and I was also doing high school ministry. And I'd bring him in, and I'd introduce him as the Apostle Jeff. And he just smiled. He took it with grace, you know, because the Lord had an anointing on him to send him into Russia and planted churches. And so here, uh, there's only 12 original apostles, and, and we could go into that more further because in the in heaven we'll see 12 pearls with the names of the apostles on the gates on the gates of the city and there's there's the 12 apostles that will always be remembered but i think there's also an apostolic gift that when somebody is sent and anointed by god and they're planting churches and there's obviously god's hands upon him when the apostles plural barnabas and paul heard this they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude crying out saying Men, why are you doing these things? We also are, are men like you are. They're the same nature. And we preach to you that you should turn from these things, these useless things, to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Now, first of all, the, why did they tear their clothes? Um, it was Jewish custom. That's the way they re responded to blasphemy. You remember the... the, the uh, Pharisees and the scribes, they used to do that to Jesus, some of the things Jesus said. When he'd say something to infer that he was God or that he was, he was the son of God, they would tear their clothes. That's the way the Jews, they'd throw dirt on their head. When they would, sometimes when they'd mourn, they'd, they'd wear sackcloth and ashes. And sometimes when they're upset and they think that you're blasphemy, they tear their clothes. Well, that's one reason Paul and Barnabas tore their clothes, because it was blasphemy what they were hearing. But another reason was they want you to see what's underneath. 
cut me, I bleed. I'm not a god, okay? I'm not Zeus or Hermes. I'm just a human being. So there's a reason for that. Now, unfortunately, too many famous preachers today, they don't tear their clothes. Yes, I know. Oh, you're so great. Yes, well, it's the Lord. Have you met people like that? Don't point at me, okay? But unfortunately, there's too many famous preachers that love the fame and love the praise and they let it go to their head and can I say when anybody in ministry lets it go to their head they believe their own press they're ruined they're ruined when you forget who it's all about what it's really all about get out of the ministry go find a, a, a real job you know because th that'll ruin a lot of preachers I like the way <clears throat> Paul said it um, <clears throat> In, in 2 Corinthians 4, 5, I love this verse. One of my memory verses. Because the apostles had this attitude. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves your servants for Christ's sake. That should be the heart of every spiritual leader. We don't preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves your servants for Christ's sake. That's the attitude of a true minister, okay? Now, what we're going to see here, let's see, did I read that verse yet? Let's read uh, 16. Well, actually, the, the last part of 15 says that they're, they're saying, Why are you doing this? Turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the seas and all that are in them. This is creation evangelism. Matter of fact, that's a fill in the blank for you if you missed it. Creation evangelism. Now, to the Jews... You could tie in the story of Jesus as coming from the bloodline of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and God's promise to David to send a Messiah through his seed. You should. To a religious Jewish person, my goodness, tell them about their Messiah, Jesus Christ. But this has no relevance to a Gentile. But the concept of creation and creator does. So today, we're starting to see different ways to preach the gospel. That creation evangelism is a legitimate way, Paul and Barnabas did it, to share the gospel with the non-religious people, okay? Because the creator and the creation, that, that makes sense. As a matter of fact, the Old Testament covers that too. Have you heard Psalm 19? Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. I'm telling you something, the more I've studied, now I'm no scientist, but the more I've studied the, the known universe through the microscope or the telescope and, 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 and understand how things work, the more I see that is not an accident. This is design by a designer. And so creation evangelism could be a powerful tool. You gotta learn your stuff you got to learn what their opposition is, what their objections are, and learn the truth. Do a little bit of homework. But there is ample evidence that there is a creator. You know, you don't look at a painting and say, well, that just happened. There was a painter. You don't look at a house and just go, yeah, there was an explosion in the forest five miles away, and all the wood just landed like this. There was a builder. Okay? And so the more you study about the universe, the more you understand there was a designer to this. It didn't just happen. It's not, you're not just looking at chaos, okay? I like the way uh, the New Living puts part of Psalm 19. Bear with me here. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his crops, craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or without a word. Their voice is never heard. You could hear the gospel. You could he hear God saying, I'm real, without a voice. You don't have to hear a voice, just look up. Just look at a chart of the solar system. Look at one of those uh, maps of, of even our solar system with the earth and the sun and the, the, the planets orbiting. You're just going, that is beautiful. That is perfect. Uh, one of my favorite topics, I'm not going to get off on it. Help me, Lord. But, you know, if you, if you move the earth a little bit closer to the sun, we'd all fry. Move the earth a little bit further away, we'd all freeze, which is perfect. We're spinning at the right speed. We're tilted at the right angle. We have a moon at the right place. If we didn't have that moon, we wouldn't be able to survive either. So much. You could go on and on. Look it up on YouTube. I'm not going to go on. I could go off on this, okay? But let me just say, Psalm 14.1 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That, that's why I think some scientists are foolish. 
They studied all. They see all the facts. They can even, whether it's the microscope or telescope, they can look at DNA and, 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 and see the intricacy of the atoms and the molecules and the DNA and, and the cell itself. And they go, yep, that's evolution at work. You have, to, you have to be a fool to do that. Okay, keep reading. Verse 16, Paul says in his message, who, speaking of this God of creation, the creator, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good. He gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitude from sacrificing to them. They, they, they go, well, we got the cow, we got the garland, we got the fire, the wood, we want to sacrifice to you. And Paul's going, wait I'm here to tell you just the opposite. Turn from all of these false God, he calls them useless things, foolish things. Turn from this false religion to the true and living God who made heaven and earth and the seas and all that is in them. See the tough spot he was in? But you see the approach he took? He didn't preach the Hebrew scriptures. He, he used creation evangelism. Now here's another fill in the blank for y'all. Paul's presentation had to be different from the Gentiles, uh, to the Gentiles, since they didn't have the Hebrew scriptures. You know, if somebody wasn't raised on the Bible, you can't necessarily quote the Bible uh, to build your case. Uh, so Paul's gospel message was all about the God of creation. I think that's legitimate. Some people go, no, I just like to quote scriptures. You know, when I used to go witnessing on the street uh, uh, back in California, I would, as a matter of fact, even today when I go door to door, I don't bring, I don't carry my Bible with me. Of course, I always got my phone. It's got the whole Bible on it. Uh, because most people aren't saying, show me in the Bible where it says that. Most unbelievers, they just need to hear about the God of creation. They need to, and of course, I've been doing this long enough, I could quote some scriptures without having my Bible on me, okay? And so I don't think I need to Bible thump them. I need to reason with them and share the heart of the gospel. And so Paul's gospel message was all about the God of creation. That's the fill-in, okay? Now, even after all this, it says in verse 18, they still could scarcely stop them from sacrificing to them. Well, their trouble isn't over. Let's look at verse 19. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. It's like they can't get away from these. This is, excuse me, this is where they came 100 miles from Iconium. I had it wrong. The Iconium, that's the Jews from Iconium, came here. Uh, or excuse me, from Antioch and Iconium. And they, they were poisoning the minds of these new believers as well. And here comes trouble. So they, they came over 100 miles just to oppose Paul and Barnabas. You got determined adversaries like that? You got people who are just determined. They'll go, they'll go 100 miles to make you miserable, right? Well, if you don't, let me just warn you, you do. It's the devil. The devil is relentless. We've got spiritual forces in high places, spiritual wickedness in high places that are out to destroy the Christian. And the devil is relentless. He's determined. He's a determined adversary. And I think that we need to have... We need to put on the full armor of God, and we need to be more determined and tough. You know, I heard it said about a pastor, about pastors in general, that a pastor has to have the mind of, the, of a scholar, the heart of a child, and the height of a rhinoceros. And, and that's what ministry is about. You can't just go, oh, he's such a tender-hearted guy. Well, he's going to get eaten alive, okay? There's, for Christians, we've got to be tough, too we got to set our mind for warfare. I like the way Peter puts it in 1 Peter 5, verse 8. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. He says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering you are. In this kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Jesus Christ. So after you've suffered a little, by the way, you're going to suffer a little. You know nobody gets out of this thing alive, life. We're all going to suffer a little. So that after you suffered for a little while, he will restore and support and strengthen you. He will place you on a firm foundation 
all power to him forever. Amen. I, I, I just think we need to realize, don't be surprised when trouble comes. Some people make it sound like, oh, when you become a Christian, just accept Christ and you'll always be healthy and wealthy and, and wise. You'll have everything and every life will be wonderful. It'll be, it's a different gospel, right? I accepted Jesus and everything was wonderful. Well, that might be the honeymoon for the first two weeks, maybe. God will protect you new Christians for just a little bit, but I'm telling you, you accept Christ, you're in for battle. Because you have an adversary, the devil, and he's relentless, and he's going to try to steal, kill, and destroy, and, and he's good at it. But by the way, have you, have you noticed the U-turn here in verse 19? These same people wanted to worship Paul and Barnabas and sacrifice to them, and they had the, the, the oxen and the garland, and they're ready to sacrifice, and they could barely stop them from doing it. In verse 19, they stoned Paul and Barnabas. How fickle crowds can be, you know? All it takes is the right politician to come along or the right religious leader to come along and, and, and with itching ears, people listen and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember I told you that, the poisoning of the minds? That's what's happening here. I like the way D David Gusek describes it. He says, this is a dramatic demonstration of how fickle a crowd can be. Their admiration of the miracle and desire to honor Paul and Barnabas as gods did not last long. It's a dangerous, it is dangerous for any spiritual leader to cultivate or allow a kind of hero worship. The, the same people who give this honor will feel terribly betrayed when the leader is shown to be human. So right up front, when people, people want to praise me in any way, not that I get too much of that, uh, I, I want to let you know I'm a person. I'm a human being. And, and you look at any leader and you over, you'll idolize him, you wait long enough, you're going to find uh, uh, heels of clay. You know, you're going to find something is wrong because we're all just people. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He's the perfect one. He's the one who'll never let you down. He's the one who'll never disappoint you. It's all, that's why I tell you it's all about Jesus, okay? All right, we're, we're, we're wrapping things up here. Uh, verse 19 said that, that they, they took Paul and they dragged him out of the city supposing him to be dead. I mean, these people were going to sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas end up sacrificing Paul and Barnabas. They end up stoning them, dragging them. I'm trying to picture how this was. How do you drag someone out of the city? Probably by their feet. I'm sure they had a few bruises on their head by the time. Dum, 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 you know. This was not a pretty picture. And it said that, uh, however, in verse 20, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. What was he thinking? How about rising up and going away from the city? He rose up and went into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. Now, that's showing you the height of a rhinoceros, right? That's showing you somebody goes, thank you, Lord, for raising me back up. Thank you that I'm not dead, but I'm going to go into the city now and let them know, by the way, look what God did. Because I, can, I can't help it. My imagination is kind of twisted. I wonder how black and blue he was. You know, I wonder how bruised up he was. I mean, if it was me, I'd probably walk into the city like this. <laughs> no, I didn't. He probably didn't look pretty, you know? I mean, because he got stoned. He got, I mean, he walked back into the city. Just to let them know what God had done. That's a good, a good witness here. And, and now, next week, we're going to go a little bit deeper on these two verses and then move forward. Why is because some believe that Paul actually did die here and that he was brought back to life by the prayers of the believers. And, and many believe that this is where he had that, that revelation in heaven spoken about in 2 Corinthians 12. You might want to jot that down and, and look it up for your homework. 2 Corinthians 12, Paul actually says, I know a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, but he, he was brought into the third heaven and he saw things that he couldn't repeat, you know. And it's like something happened in Paul's life. And, and this is where many people believe it took place in this stoning that he actually died and came back. We'll talk about that a little bit more uh, next week. But what we have next is we're going to go into communion. And listen, there's so many things the Lord could have spoken to you during this text. I mean, whether it's how to witness, whether it's stop whimpering and be tough. It's tough being a Christian. You need to toughen up. Whether it's encouragement about the sickness part that we looked at, that people are telling you you're sick or your friend is sick because of all these stupid things, and they're wrong. Don't believe it. Don't believe the lies of the devil. 
Uh, there's so many things I hope you take home with you just what the Lord wanted to speak to you.